Welcome to Understanding Climate with Professor Monks. Today's topic, emissions scenarios. We can measure the climate changes that have already happened. That's very useful in figuring out how we got where we are and how various processes in our Earth's system work. But what about the future? Since most of our major radiative forcings are anthropogenic, predicting how they will change in the future requires predicting what people will do in the future. And here's a hot take for you, no pun intended. Social science, the study of human behavior and institutions, is harder than natural science, the study of the non-human world. Then again, I was trained as a social scientist, so I would say that. Predicting the future course of human society requires understanding a lot of different domains. There's politics, economics, culture, family systems, religion, and various other phenomena, each with their own complicated set of feedbacks. Plus, human societies have a characteristic called reflexivity. Let's say the phenomenon I'm interested in is a natural one, such as what happens to carbon levels in the ocean when CO2 in the atmosphere increases. I analyze my measurements, come up with a well-supported theory, and share it with other climate scientists. We can now predict the effects of adding CO2 to the atmosphere in the future. The process works the same before and after I publish my study. We just know more about it after the study. Notice that the study itself is now part of the social system. It didn't affect the carbon cycle because it's in a separate natural system. But if you do a study about human behaviors or institutions, your study is part of the same human system that you're studying. The people you did your study on can learn the results of the study, and ethically speaking, you should share your results with your subjects. Then they can change their behavior based on what they learned from your study. This behavior change might then invalidate your theory, or it might make your theory match reality better. For example, much of the theory in economics is based on treating people as rational maximizers of their self-interest. The more you study economics, the more you start to act like a rational maximizer in a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Likewise, learning your astrological sign tends to make people act more like what their sign is supposed to be like, exhibiting the personality characteristics associated with that sign, unless they're an astrology skeptic, in which case they may start acting in contradiction to their sign in order to prove it's wrong. Reflexivity makes things more complicated, but it's ultimately a good thing. It means we have the ability to recognize where our society is going and act to change course. Hopefully at the end of this class, you will have some ideas about what outcomes are desirable and undesirable, and how our society might change to achieve the desirable ones. So rather than making a single prediction about how anthropogenic forcings will change in the future, climate scientists construct scenarios. A scenario is a plausible story about what might happen. One common scenario that gets considered in many applications is a business-as-usual scenario. Under business as usual, we assume that current trends will continue with no real changes. This provides a baseline to compare other scenarios. One way to build scenarios about future anthropogenic forcings is to build them bottom up. This means that you start by trying to guess at future economic, political, and cultural changes. Then you estimate how those changes will alter the forcings our society produces. The IPCC created a set of bottom up scenarios in their special report on emissions scenarios. They split the possible outcomes into group A for scenarios that emphasized economic development and group B for scenarios that emphasized environmental protection. As you can probably guess, group A scenarios involved higher greenhouse gas emissions. Then they split them into group one for scenarios that envisioned a more globalized world with extensive international trade and group two for scenarios in which economic activity remained more regionally focused. Another way to build scenarios is to work backwards from the outcome which we can refer to as a top-down scenario. Here, you begin by identifying some specific outcomes that you're concerned about. For example, some where there's dangerously high global warming and others where global warming is kept modest. Then you figure out what kind of social changes could produce those outcomes. The IPCC also built some top-down scenarios referred to as representative concentration pathways. These are referred to by numbers indicating the net radiative forcing by the year 2100. So RCP6 is a scenario that results in a 6 watt per meter squared radiative forcing in 2100, while RCP2.6 is a scenario with 2.6 watts per meter squared in 2100. Remember that we're over 2 watts per meter squared of radiative forcing already. These scenarios don't allow us to predict what definitely will happen in the future, 
but they do allow us to make if-then statements. If we want to avoid a certain kind of climate outcome, then we need to do whatever was in the scenarios that avoided that outcome. Much of the discussion by politicians and activists about climate change focuses on trying to achieve certain amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere based on the likely outcomes. Recall that before the industrial era, there were about 280 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. It reached 370 parts per million by the year 2000 and 415 parts per million by 2020. Doubling the pre-industrial CO2 would give a concentration of 560 parts per million. Recall that our best estimates of climate sensitivity tell us that such a level would lead to about a three degree rise in global temperatures. There would be a variety of dangerous effects from a change of that magnitude, which we'll address in future videos. So most people working on climate issues say that we need to stay below that. Another popular target is 450 parts per million. That's a tough number to hit and requ would require reining in our carbon emissions pretty quickly. But a concentration of 450 parts per million would lead to about a two degree rise in temperature, which many climatologists think would avoid some of the more catastrophic effects of climate change, as well as scenarios where our positive feedback loops get out of control. However, many activists have adopted 350 parts per million as their demand. They argue that there's enough uncertainty in climate modeling that we can't be sure that 450 parts per million is safe. With the entire global climate in the balance, they say, we should leave a buffer to protect against unexpected complications. Note that 350 parts per million is less than the current atmospheric concentrations. That means we would not just have to reduce anthropogenic emissions, but actually create a net flow of carbon out of the atmosphere to get back down to 350 parts per million. The kind of thinking exhibited by advocates of 350 parts per million CO2 threshold is referred to as the precautionary principle. There are various stronger or weaker formulations of the precautionary principle, but I'll leave you with the version that was included in the Rio Declaration, signed by the countries of the world at the 1992 United Nations Conference on the Environment and Development in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. The Rio Declaration is important because that same conference was where the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was adopted. This treaty created the IPCC and has been the framework for negotiating more specific international agreements about climate change, such as the 1997 Kyoto Protocol and the 2015 Paris Accords.